In coordination with the State Library of North Carolina, Wayne County Public Library will host three virtual programs entitled She Changed the World, North Carolina Women Breaking Barriers. Thank you for joining us in celebrating their strength, resilience, courage, and bravery. I'm Paul Sailors, local history assistant at the Wayne County Public Library. Our local Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History program continues the library stewardship by sharing the lives of three incredible women from Goldsboro, Gertrude Wheel, Ruth Whitehead Whaley, and Dorothy Foreman Cotton. Dorothy Foreman Cotton was an American civil rights activist and leader serving as the highest ranking woman in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. For 12 years, she worked as the educational director, teaching people about their civil rights and registering citizens to vote. Dorothy had three sisters, her mother having died in 1934 when she was only three. The four Foreman girls were very close in age. Her father, Claude Foreman, was drafted into the Navy in 1940 when Dorothy was only 12 years old. Dorothy asked her father many years later why he didn't tell the Navy he had four small children and no wife or mother to care for them, and his response was that he did. They lived at 917 Greenleaf Street in a shotgun house, a long and narrow one-story house not far from the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Factory where Claude worked at the time of his draft notice. Dorothy had a very rough childhood with little to eat, little to play with, but a brilliant mind. Knowing at an early age that she wanted to get out of Goldsboro and the squalor in which she lived. She kept her grades up and by the time she got to Dillard High School, she was involved in many of the clubs, bands, and other organizations within the school. Dillard had large clubs and extracurricular activities. The Drama Club, Glee Club, Baseball, Boys and Girls Basketball, Football, and the school newspaper, the Dillardite. This is a picture of the Drama Club at Dillard in 1947. Dorothy is on the front row on the far left. This would be a year before she graduated high school. This is Miss Rosa Gray. She was an English teacher and the drama club coach at Dillard. She was Dorothy's divine intervention. Miss Gray took a real and constant interest in Dorothy's welfare and education. Dorothy had a passion for learning and Miss Gray was drawn to that. She never failed to look out for Dorothy, whether it was making sure Dorothy had lunch or just making sure she did well on her assignments. She was like a mother figure. One day, after reciting a poem in class, Dorothy walked back to her seat and Miss Gray said to her, There's your ready, girl, which was a phrase in the 1940s used to compliment a person who was the best in their field. Miss Gray was the reason why she majored in English in college. Miss Gray had some ends at Shaw University, so she encouraged Dorothy to go there. Cotton left for Shaw University where she paid for college classes by working three jobs as a housekeeper in the dorms. She worked in the dining hall and she worked as a housekeeper for the president of the university, Dr. Robert Prentice Daniel. Dr. Daniel accepted the position of president at Virginia State College in Petersburg, Virginia. So Cotton transferred there and completed a degree in English and library science in 1954. After graduating from Virginia, she married George Cotton. George was in the military at Fort Lee. They courted for a long time. They honeymooned in Washington, D.C. and settled back into an apartment in Petersburg, Virginia. Dorothy worked at the college library for about four years, but decided that she still was not fulfilled. She decided to enroll at Boston University in the Special Education Department studying speech therapy. 
she decided this partly because the school system in Petersburg did not have a speech therapist. She could travel from school to school and visit with students who have speech issues. She graduated in 1960 and returned to Petersburg. When she returned to Petersburg, her work allowed her to move about the school system and in working with her local church, Gilfield Baptist Church, she was able to first meet Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Wyatt T. Walker, the man on the left in the picture, was the pastor at the time. He was invited by King to Atlanta to serve as the SCLC's executive director. Walker asked Cotton to join the organization as his administrative assistant. She would go on to serve the next 12 years as the national director of education. She was the only female member of the executive staff and became one of King's closest colleagues. Her position in his inner circle put her at the forefront of the civil rights movement as an educator, planner, activist, and leader. Her room was right next door to Dr. King's when he was shot in 1968. The civil rights movement was the crucible in which a life dedicated to learning, teaching, and inspiring others was forged for Dorothy. The picture on the left is a protest in St. Augustine, Florida in 1964. Picture on the right is Dorothy giving a speech at the Atlanta History Center in 1972. Her most important work was the development and leadership of the Citizenship Education Program, founded in 1961 with the support of the SCLC. This picture depicts a mock sit-in with Dorothy and her colleague harassing these students, blowing smoke in their face and messing with their clothes. You can see the boy's tie has been placed on his head and the man blowing smoke in the other boy's ear. The point was to protest peacefully and not let them break you down. The CEP trained disenfranchised people in the importance of civic and political participation and the organizing methods for voter registration and nonviolent protest. The citizenship schools were for adults. Their immediate program was teaching, reading, and writing. They helped students pass literacy tests for voting, but they also gave an all-around education in community development, which included housing, recreation, health, and improved home life. Specific subjects included filing income tax forms, understanding tax supported resources such as water testing for wells, aid to handicapped children, public health facilities, how government is run, social security, etc. The picture above is Dorothy Cotton teaching black men and women how to write in cursive. Back then, in order to vote, you had to be able to sign your name in cursive. Dorothy continued at the SCLC for three years after the assassination of Dr. King and later became the South Regional Director for Action, the Federal Agency for Volunteer Programs under the Carter administration. From 1982 to 1991, she was Director of Student Activities at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. She later founded her own consulting company, and she was founding member of the National Citizenship School. And among many other accolades, she received three honorary doctorate degrees. The Dorothy Cotton Institute was founded by Dorothy and a small group of her colleagues in 2007. In 2010, she received the National Freedom Award from the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. The Dorothy Cotton Jubilee Singers was founded in 2010 at Ithaca College and is dedicated to the preservation of Negro spirituals. In 2012, she wrote a book about the role of the Citizenship Education Program 
the CEP. In the Civil Rights Movement, and she titled it, If Your Back's Not Bent. And now I would like to introduce Gwendolyn Perry, Mrs. Dorothy Cotton's niece, for some insight, information, and personal memories of her relationship with Ms. Cotton. My name is Gwendolyn Perry. I'm the grandniece of the civil rights icon, Dr. Dorothy Cotton. She didn't have any children growing up, so we were her children, her nieces and nephews. We grew up just knowing her as Aunt Dorothy, not the activist that everybody else knew her as. By the time I was old enough to travel with her, the civil rights, heart of the civil rights movement was pretty much over. I only get memories from my cousins and my aunt and my mom and Aunt Dorothy of the moments that I spent with Dr. King and the things that we did together. I do remember having Easter egg hunts at um, Andrew Young's house and me not being able to find the eggs and they would help me. I do remember that, that was a very far memory. We traveled a lot with her, like she took us, I went to Delaware, Florida, Atlanta, Alabama, everywhere. She wanted us to be a part of everything that she did. And another thing was we couldn't afford those things if it wasn't for her and taking us and exposing us to those types of things. But I'd say this, I knew from an early age that Undrathi was very different because of the stories that she told us. I remember one that she would tell us vividly about picking cotton. And when she would pick the cotton, she did not drink from the water bottle that everybody else drank from. She meant that she wasn't going to do that. She was like, that was just so unsanitary. So she would walk all the way to the watering hole, as they called it, in the hot sun, and then walk back, not thinking it through that she was going to be pretty tired and hot when she got back and her actual break was going to be over. But that's what she did. And then let me know, I thought about that as, a, as an adult, that let me see that she was going to be very different. She was not like others. She was meant and destined to be a part of changing the world. Another thing is she was also very hard on us with a lot of things. And one of the things was grammar. She was an actual speech major at one time at Boston University. And so when we didn't speak correctly, she made sure we knew it. Like if we said, there it goes, she would say, where is it going? And she even threatened us with a grandma jar. <laughs> we had to put 25 cents in the jar every time we misused our grandma. I tell you, that jar would have been full of money by the time we were adults if we really had to keep up with that. But that's something that she would do. We had a lot of good times. I remember going to the beaches of Delaware where um, we stayed in a beach house right on the beach that belonged to her best friend, Joyce. And I remember us going to camp Every summer, she would send us to two weeks to camp in Somerville, Georgia, and that really molded us and made us and gave us a lot of independence, something that we would not have done if we were at home. But I, I, I really enjoyed those times and they have such fond memories that I have of all of that. But I, I say this, I didn't really understand or realize who my Aunt Dorothy really was until one time as an adult, I believe I was probably in my, my 40s, and she came to my hometown of Richmond, Virginia, and she was speaking at some, I think guess it was the Southern Gentlemen, something like that, but they were the good old boys of the Caucasian race, and she had, it was a lot of them filling the room in the convention center, and she began to speak, and for once, I really sat there and I really listened to what she had to say, and my heart was so full listening to what she had to go through and how she went through it, and how she captivated her audience and everybody listened and the song she sung. She loved to sing and she loved to incorporate song in her speeches. And the song that she sung and the way that she spoke, these guys, the good old guys, good old boys, they gave her a standing ovation and they even wanted an encore. They wanted her to come back. They just would not stop. It was thunderous clapping. I remember people coming up to her asking her about different people of the movement, like Fannie Lou Hammer. She says, do I know them? I could tell you backstories that you wouldn't even believe. And that was the type of thing she talked about. And that's the first time I really saw her as the civil rights activist and not just my aunt, because the things she went through paved the way for us. One thing I remember too, I was sitting in a, a article through um, media, social media, and it was about some movements that were held down in Florida. 
And when I read it, I said, wow, these movements sound so familiar to me. And the reason it sounded familiar was because I remembered my aunt telling me about her organizing these things in Florida and getting hit so hard in her ear that she lost hearing behind that. I said, wow, it made me like so proud to see an article and knowing that my aunt was a part of this movement and that she was one of the ones that actually not just a part of it, but she organized it. That was just so amazing to me. So I, I say this, I wonder sometimes how she would respond right now to what's going on in the unrest of our country right now. I believe even at her age, she would be somewhere organizing something and putting it together because I remember interviewing her in her older years, her latter years, and one of the questions I asked her is what would she do when things were just starting to jump off? And what she would do is she said, first you have to find what you want and then you organize and strategize to get there. So I could see her in some boardroom organizing and strategizing to see what we were gonna do during this time. This week I, I stood at the um, Stonewall Jackson statue here in Richmond, Virginia. It was in the pouring rain while they were preparing and I watched them dismantle this statue. And I was fighting back tears because I thought about how my aunt would have felt during this time. Something that she fought for back then, now it's the year 2020 and we're still having to fight for it. I think she would have so many mixed emotions and feelings because it was happening, but that we had to actually go through this again because she believed she went through it so we wouldn't have to go through it. But now this is all happening all over again and that, I just couldn't get my mind off of her while I was standing there watching them do this and fight back my tears. I believe that the world is such a better place because Dr. Dorothy Cotton was a part of it and she was a part of the change that they've made in this country. Even though we have a long ways to go, she was a part of that first round of changes that happened right at, during the Jim Crow, right after the Jim Crow. So I believe that she made this world a better place because she was in it. And I feel that I'm a better person because of the fact that I can call her my aunt. It has helped me. I thank God for that opportunity to be a part of her family and to have been able to be close to her and to hear these stories firsthand and enjoy her in this, this time. So I thank you for listening and hope you got something out of it. Ms. Cotton died on June 10th, 2018 in Ithaca, New York. I'm gonna quote the Reverend Dr. William Barber in a statement about Dorothy. Dr. Dorothy Cotton was a major force in the civil rights movement. She led trainings in violent protests and also development for policy and vision for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. From Goldsboro, she led a life of service that helped change the nation and the world. End quote. Just want to thank everyone for joining us for our last well-behaved women seldom make history. A special thank you to Dorothy Cotton Institute at Cornell University, the CEP for the 21st century, and Dorothy's niece, Gwendolyn Perry. Thanks again.